Hi everyone! Thank you for tuning in. So it's Sunday and we're going to um, talk about a few, you know, frequently asked questions about OPT, H1B, maintenance of status. Right now, you know, OPT for people who want to know about um, options if they're not selected in the lottery, not yet. A lot of people are planning changing of status and because of the virus outbreak, you know, a lot of people may be losing their job on H-1B. That's always a bad thing, but they're looking to transfer H-1B mm -hmm. or change to another status so that they have more time to look for an employer. So that's, um, th those are the type of issues that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so before we do that, let's wait for, you know, people to trickle in. So we'll, we'll, I'm hoping to have at least 40 people. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a decent sized group. And then I made a little note for myself because um, I got notes from my social media manager. Mm -hmm. He says, every single time when you do a, a live video, you have to tell people a few things to begin, like there's a ritual. You have to tell them to go and follow me. Well, my friend list is already full, so you can only follow me. And when you click follow, you're supposed to click again. There's a drop down and then check C first. That way my post will not be buried like in a million other posts, you know, like cats and dogs photos and things like that. So make sure if you want to see my videos or if you want to know that I'm doing something for immigration community, then just make sure you drop down and check C first. And uh, that way, you know, you won't miss uh, any updates that I send. Mm -hmm. uh, I send updates pretty frequently. And let's just hope that in the next hour and a half, no one calls me. I don't think anyone's going to call me. If you intentionally call me and disrupt my live stream, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, so follow me, drop down, and choose C first. And then, uh, so you don't miss important updates. Oh, and join my group. So we have this group and it's growing really fast. Now there's like about 800 people in there. The group is called U.S. Work Visa and Green Card and Citizenship Help. Okay, so this group is hosted by me exclusively. People in the group will share, you know, their experience. But for now, mostly people are kind of quiet and they just post questions and I answer them. So it's kind of a, you know, a teachable forum for people to go in and uh, ask the question and then I if I think that my answer will help everyone else in the in the in the group then I will share my answers so um make sure you join the group US work visa and green card and citizenship help so follow me drop down C first and then join the group okay so oh we have 55 good it's, it's kind of start so um welcome to Jack's class about immigration law. <laughs> Who would have think that you would take a class on Sunday? But, you know, with this situation right now, as bad as it is, I think that it promotes a lot of information to be transmitted online. And uh, a lot of times, you know, people are able to go to class and do other things without having to leave their house. I think that's great. So um, what I'm hoping to do is I have three case studies here. Uh, and the questions are sort of, I got questions from everybody. Thank you, by the way, for giving me questions. And the questions can largely be grouped into three different type of cases, which is why I have three case types. But the case types don't include, it, they don't capture everyone's question. So once we run through, you know, the materials in front of us, then I'll open up the floor for questions and answering. Uh, you have to keep in mind though, that you know i'm using i'm doing it on my phone so if five people ask questions at the same time i only have two sets of eyes so i can't i i can't answer five at the same time but um but you know i will go back and answer each and every one of them sorry i'm a little distracted because i'm trying to watch myself on live using another account so that i can read the questions more carefully because when the questions run See, someone's already asking questions. Okay, J uh, Janavi, hold on one second, because I need to figure out how to watch myself. Uh, because like when I go online, oh, here, I see, okay. Uh, okay, I don't want sound, okay. All right, okay, so I can see everyone's, I can see Sean, he says, thanks for hosting, you're welcome. And I see, Oh, 
Oh, okay, thanks for hosting. You're welcome. Anyway, I'm not gonna do that for every single one of them, so don't stop taking. And, and then I um, and then somebody asked a question, so I am going to copy and paste this question onto a little note thing that I have called Google Keeps, and uh, so that it doesn't get buried, you know, um, with the rest of the questions. And then we'll, we will get back to answer this question. And what I'm hoping is when people, uh, when we are done with the material and people ask questions, we can say, look at case study number one or case study number two. It will add to our existing um, case studies. So I, I think that's how it works better that way. I remember things better with names and stories. So I, I was hoping that the story would resonate and um, that way people can remember uh, you know, the information based on the stories and try to see if you, if you're like in case study number one or if your situation fits more like case study number two or something along those lines. Okay, so without further ado, let's um, go to case study number one. So Deepak was on H1B status, having won the lottery in 2019, so he got approved last year, and his petition was approved in December 2019 after mm -hmm. premium processing. His H-1B petition approval is valid until December 2022. In, on, <laughs> typo, on February 20th, 2020, he learned that his employment was terminated and the employer will withdraw the H-1B petition. He would like to remain in the U.S. to look for the next opportunity to transfer his existing H-1B to the next employer. So I, I think a lot of people are in, in similar positions. Um, now, number one, can he f still file an H-1B transfer? If he finds an H-1B petitioner today, today we're assuming G uh, April 26. So I set the dates um, to learn about the, the uh, termination as February 20th. So it's outside 60, grace per 60 day grace period. So I asked that question sort of rhetorically to, well, I'm not rhetorically. I asked that question because I wanted to touch upon the, the grace period. So right now, since he's already outside the grace period, because you know, 60 days after February 20th, 20, 20, uh, February 20th would put, would put today outside of that period. So he can still file an H-1B petition. So what I hear from people is they, some people believe, not all, but some people believe that when you're outside the grace period, somehow if your H-1B was withdrawn from the last employer, you're not able to refile or transfer no, I don't know where they get that from. But even if you, uh, your last employer withdraws the H-1B, you can still f transfer even outside the grace period because you are cap exempt from having to end of the lottery again for six years. So you can always have another employer transferred over after six years. Now the question becomes, um, what happens if you file after you know, grace period? And right now, you just have to remember that if you file after grace period, there's a chance that USCIS will find that you didn't maintain your status and therefore give you an I-797B approval notice and ask you to re-enter the United States to activate that petition and get a new I-94 for that employer. Now, if you don't have an H-1B visa in your passport, then you have to go get one, come back, activate that petition, and then start working for that employer. So... If you go outside a 60 day grace period, you can still refile. But if USCIS finds that you have not connected your status, then you have to re-enter the US to activate that petition. Now, if you're outside the grace period, you can cite COVID-19 as the reason why there's a late filing. When you do that, because USCIS recently come out with instructions on sort of giving mercy for people who are affected by COVID-19, and if you do that, you probably will extend your grace period. I know that a lot of people are talking about, oh, you know, how can USCIS, how can we like push for the grace period to be extended? Actually, if you look at USCIS's latest coronavirus instructions about filing something late, they already kind of quietly said, hey, if you're affected by this and you're filing it late, just tell us how you're affected by the coronavirus. So moving forward, you always wanna think coronavirus, coronavirus, how do I use that to my advantage to do a late filing, such as 
filing outside the grace period, for example. So that's number one. And you know, a lot of these questions have probably answered themselves but once I start talking a lot. So will his transfer, H1B transfer petition be approved? Yes, of course. His employer is asking him to file consular processing instead of an extension of status. What difference does it make in his situation? So a lot of people, that the, the reason why I ask this question is because people ask me about joining upon receipt of an H-1B. So in order to join on receipt, you need to have file an extension of status because the status has to continue in order for you to be able to work for that employer upon receipt. If that employer files consular processing, I don't believe that work authorization would immediately extend to that petition. You would have to wait until that petition is approved. You get an I-797B, you have to go outside the country like we said in number one, come back, activate it, then you can work. The join upon receipt thing doesn't apply to consular processing. It only applies if the employer requested an extension. So most employers will request extensions. They like that because they need the flexibility for you to be able to join them as soon as possible. That's why they file for extension instead of consular processing. But if any employer is so dumb and they tell you to file consular processing, then you tell them that I'm not going to be able to join you until I get the approval, go outside, come back, because I don't, right now, there's no premium processing and that's going to be waiting for months. So most employers, if they know what they're talking about, they should not be filing consular processing for an, for an H-1B transfer. It wouldn't make sense, at, at least at this time. But, you know, when premium processing was around, you can do a premium processing consular process really quick. And especially if you already have an H-1B visa in your passport, you can get it done, get it, you know, you don't need any pay subs and just go outside and come right back in. But right now, because of the virus, re-entering the United States has become very difficult. So you don't want to risk that. So there definitely, when you're doing the, the transfer petition, don't go for consular processing. That's why I asked that question, because the answer sort of, flows from there. So if the next question, number four, if his new petition was filed with an H-1B extension request to USCIS, can he join the employer upon receipt of the transfer petition? Yes, he can. We just talked about that. Number five, can his extension request be approved even though he filed his transfer petition after his 60-day grace period has expired and that his employer had withdrawn his petition? Yes. And we already talked about that. Now, um, since this question is asked again, I'm going to say something a little bit more about that. Um, remember coronavirus. So if you, if he's filed after the 60 day grace period and he asks for an extension, if USCIS says, I mean, there's always a, some room to decide when that 60 day starts because the 60 day really starts when you're last being paid. Like if you have a pay stub that shows you're last paid on this day, say, so logically your 60 day should start after that date. So make sure you can work with the employer in extending that by doing something with the pay, the last paycheck uh, or paid leave or th things like that. So there's already a lot of wiggle room with the 60 day. And even after that, you know, you can cite the virus as a reason why there's a late filing outside the 60 day. And we don't know how USCI is going to deal with this because it just started. But I think that they will listen, at least with some cases. If you make a logical connection between COVID-19 to your loss of employment, for example, I mean, your employer can do a declaration that says because of COVID-19, we're cutting, you know, 20% of our workforce and unexpectedly, like over a week. So without really having prepared yourself for a transfer, that's why you had to file outside the grace period. So that's one reasonable way to kind of explain why, if you're outside the grace period, you should still have your status extended. So, so I think that's the secret to extending the 60-day grace period, is to use the coronavirus and make a reasonable connection between the outbreak and your loss of employment. Okay, let's move on. Number six, when is the latest date DPAC has to depart the United States to avoid the three-year bar for overstaying and accruing a lawful presence? Good question. Because, you know, DPAC has an I-94 that is not, that is withdrawn. So at some point, he's going to lose status after he leaves employment. He has, um, he has another petition 
Wait, he hasn't filed another petition yet. Sorry. So, so from that day, usually you count 180 days from the day you lose your employment. But realistically, when an employer withdraws the H-1B from termination day, there's still about two to three weeks where that withdrawal letter gets sent to USCIS, processed, and then gets into the system. That's when the I-94 is canceled. So, but then, you know, you don't want to risk it because you don't really know as an employee when that's going to happen. The employer, your ex-employer would never tell you because they don't have to. So you will try to count from the date your status ended 180 days. And that's the absolute deadline you have to leave unless you file a change of status so that the pending application will toll, you know, the unlawful presence days and you can stay until the uh, change of status application is approved. And I think we'll talk about that later down the road. I don't want to stuff too much information because we have to go at this slowly because there's a lot of information to digest about things like this. So back to the question, when is the latest date DPAC has to leave? Assuming he doesn't file mm -hmm. any other applications, he has to leave within 180 days from the day he leaves his work. I know people are going to be asking, well, is he going to be out of status? Oh, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. he's going to be out of status. But there is no three-year, 10-year punishment until you cross that 180 day. When does the 180 day start? It should start on the day you leave your job. Don't count any more grace period or whatever after that. Just remember, if you're not going to file anything, you should leave within 180 days from leaving your job. But that changes, of course, if you do a change of status or if you file uh, another H-1B petition with an extension, mm -hmm. that gets told. So this whole 180 day just gets thrown out the window. You don't need to worry about it. But if you absolutely cannot find another employer to take over the H-1B and you don't want to file a change of status because you can't come up with $370, then you would have to leave within 180 days. So that's the complete answer to that. It depends on the situation and there are different layers of the facts that will cause things to be analyzed a little differently. Now, number seven, um, will filing a change of status application help DPAC avoid being out of status and accruing a lawful presence? The answer is yes. And we kind of alluded to that when we we're talking about number six. Whenever you have a pending application to change status with USCIS, an extension application, your unlawful presence is told, meaning like it doesn't start until USCIS gives you a decision on that change of status, excuse me, on that change of status application. So, um, so you might want to think about filing a change of status application to buy you a little bit more time so that you can find another employer in the United States to take over your H-1B. And it is much easier to find another employer when you're physically present in the U.S. than if you're back in your home country because it's hard to reach out to an employer, it's hard to do interviews, it's easier when you're here. That's always the truth. So um, if you want to, if you don't have a little bit more time after being laid off from H-1B, you can always file a change of status. And now when should you file that change of status? I would say as soon as possible. Even though there is that 60-day grace period, I didn't read anywhere in the regulations that that will allow USCIS to use that grace period to say you're still in status to be able to file a change of status. So if you're filing right, you know, like after your employment is terminated, you would have to cite COVID-19 and say, oh, this is a late filing because, you know, um, I, I've tried to file as soon as possible and it was so unexpected. So the reasonableness, you know, it, 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 there is a, there's a, there's a window. So like within 60 days, I think fine, because USCIS has already used that as a grace period to find a new employer. So you can always kind of reference that 60 day and say, hey, look, there's a 60 day grace period, although not statutory. I mean, it is in the memo that was, that came out in November, 2017, but it's not statutory. So the USCIS doesn't have to listen to it, technically speaking, but you can always cite it because lately there was another memo. It's not a memo. It was like a, a notice about they will accept late filings, but you have, you have to draw the connection between the virus and also uh, the reason for the late filing. So let's move on. Um, number eight, will this change of status application be approved if you file it outside the 60 day grace period? If it's outside 60 day, less likely than before 60 day. Although there's no rhyme or reason for that. It's just that the 60 day has been used and recognized by USCIS officers as a buffer for H-1Bs to make their next move. 
So if you file a change of status, you have to have a good reason why you waited outside the 60 day. I mean, you could say like, well, during the 60 day, I was looking for an employer. I didn't think that I needed to stay a little longer, but plans have changed and it changed suddenly. Or like, for example, they always like things out of your control. For example, if your country suddenly locked down after 60 days, you were going to leave, but now you can't. So you have to file a change of status. And this unexpected change, you know, was not due to your own fault and you have no control over it. And USCIS will be more likely to approve that kind of petition. Number nine, can Deepak remain in the United States legally while his change of status application is pending in US, in US, with USCIS? Yes, he can. We already said that. So he can stay. And right now, change of status applications are taking six, seven, sometimes eight months to get approved. During all of that time, you're in the U.S. just waiting you know, and although you're not work authorized, but you're able to look for work and look for a petitioner that can take over, transfer your H-1B. So anyway, I just want everyone to know that we'll be taking questions at the end. So we'll have lots of time for questions, but let's just go through the materials so that hopefully it answers people's questions so that, you know, um, we don't have to go one at a, you know one by one because these questions, I think, might pertain to a wider audience because it's sort of like gathered from different sources. Okay, so uh, same fact pattern. So DPAC, fast forward to August 2020, we're in the future now. DPAC now has a pending change of status application to B2. So he listened to someone's advice and filed it. Uh, he is still looking for the H1B sponsor, but the job market is depressed as the US is now in recession. His home country has reopened and he considers going home to uh, returning to his home country. He's also looking for day one CPT schools because a few employment offers are looking hopeful, but they don't yet want to transfer his H-1B status. So questions. If he finds his next H-1B employer in June 2021, will he have to go through the lottery again? So the question assumes he left, like he's home. and. From, from, from his home country, he got connected with an employer in the United States. And in 2021, June, they filed, they tried to transfer him back to the United States. Um, so will he have to go through the lottery again? No, because he's cap exempt for six years for having the first H-1B approved. So it's to reiterate, you know, to re refresh your memory from what we discussed in case study number one uh, from earlier points. Um, is he cap exempt even though his employer had withdrawn his H-1B petition? Yes. The withdrawal of H-1B petition does not eliminate the quota that he won. It only terminates the I-94. Don't mix it up because I get a lot of people telling me, oh, once it's withdrawn and I never get it back, I have to go to the lottery again. I don't know where people get that idea. It's not true. Okay. So number two, can he get admission into a school that issues I-20 and try to change his status to F-1? This is a tough question, and I get this a lot, because he was on H-1B, and if he gets an I-20, it's a different status. So he's going to have to change status, you know, to F-1. Now, like we said, doing a change of status in the United States take a while, especially from, like, H-1B to F-1 or from B-2 to F-1. These could take, like, seven months. And if he's looking to do CPT, no one's going to wait seven months for him to get his, you know, H1, uh, get his change of status application approved, then start CPT. Usually, employers won't wait that long. So, um, this plan of changing status from the United States runs into two problems. First, he is on H-1B. If he was on STEM OPT, then it would be a lot easier because he can just transfer his service account to, the new, to, to a new school and almost immediately set up CPT and start you know, working for that employer. But on H-1B, it's a little trickier. Now, if you, this is one thing that people have done before, but right now, with the border being the way it is, they only process essential travelers. It is difficult to, I mean, I looked it up. Students coming back in uh, are considered essential travelers. Uh, and I've even called CBP to confirm. And they did tell me, if you have an I-20, and even if you have an expired student visa, you'll be able to enter the United States now um, and, and be back on F1 status without needing a new F1 visa. This is called automatic revalidation. Now, the tricky part about this move is that you're on H1B and your employer 
DPACs on H1B and DPAC employer has already withdrawn the H1B. So the I-94 may be already terminated. Now, if you go to the border, even with the pending B2 change of status application, the border requires that when you left the U.S., you still had a valid I-94. So the border might not automatically revalidate the status. Then what happens? That means you have to be, you'll be stuck at the border and you have to go to the U.S. consulate to apply for an F1 visa to return. And you will know that it's more difficult to get an F1 visa when you are coming back to do CPT because a lot of consulates don't like that. So um, if you're on H1B and you got laid off and you want to immediately go into F1 and do CPT, at this time, it's a little tough. Um, because changing status takes too long and the border is a little messy. They don't, they probably won't. Well, the problem is we don't know when the I-94 expires. So um, if you go to the border and try to ask for automatic validation, the border might say, well, in our system, it shows your, H1, your uh, H-1B I-94 was already expired when you left. So we can't give it to you. So, you know, like it's just um, kind of risky. It used to work fine. Like if the person leaves right away. Um, and they be able to get back in, n not with not with much problem. But in the current situation, I would say I don't advise anyone to leave unless absolutely necessary. And it's also risky to be at the border because you might be in the in a small confined area with a bunch of people, and you know it increases the risk of infection. So, um, so he, I would say, don't jump to the day one CPT option if you're on H one B and you're laid off because that's more of a STEM OBT option. Like if you're on STEM OBT and you didn't get selected in the lottery, day one CPT definitely is what you want to go to at this point. But if you're on H1B, it's difficult to get back onto the F1 status. So um, that, that wouldn't be the option that I advise. Number three, will he be required to go back to his home country to apply for an F1 visa if the F1 visa and his passport is already expired? Yes. So if you go to the border and he tried to automatically validate and the border says no, then he'll have to fly back home uh, or wherever, not here, wherever he's going and apply for an F1 visa, try to get one because his, his F1 visa is already expired and come back. Obviously, if your F1 visa is not expired, this will work just fine for you. You can go from H1B to F1 at the border, just go out and come back in. Your F1 visa is still valid and that's fine because you can use a valid visa and a new I-20 even though that visa has a different school's name because now you're in a different program. But that doesn't seem to like apply to a lot of people. A lot of people on H1B that are laid off already had their F1 visa expired uh, because F1 visa only lasts for five years. So, um, uh, but if you have an F1 visa in your passport, you don't have to go get a new visa. I hear that a lot too. Like somehow people think that if they change the program, they have to go and get another visa. No, that is not true. Okay. Uh, number four, can he file another COS application from B2 to F1? Technically, he can, but then the B2 change of status becomes a bridge application, and both would, I mean, the B2 would have to be approved first before the F1 can be approved, because the B2 connects from his H1B to B2, and then from his B2 to F1. So you, you're depending, you're betting two applications to be approved. And it's going to take a long time without certainty. And you're not, DPAC is not work authorized during this time. So in for six or seven months without work authorization, nobody's going to choose that option. So um, can he file another COS application? Yes, he can. If he isn't expected to work and he just sit around for both applications to run their course, which again takes six, seven or eight months in this kind of day and age. So probably not a good option. Um, can he, number five, can his COS application to F1 be approved even though his status had ended already in February, 2020? Yes, because he filed a change of status soon after February, 2020 to connect him to B2. And if that's approved and he filed an F1 in between that time, then that bridge has been built and therefore he's able to connect his status. So it can both be approved, the B2 change of status, then the F1. Um, but you have to reference that, those case numbers with USCIS because in the system, it might they might show up as two different applications. Uh, generally speaking, the change of status to B2 should be adjudicated 
before the change of status to F1, but there's no assurance. So a lot of times it's just a risky, very uncertain option. So he can though, you can file another change of status. It'll buy you, it'll buy you more time. Can he start working on day one CPT internship while the COS application is pending? No, because you know CPT has not been set up as far as I know. I mean, if anyone's ever been be able to do that, let me know. But you're not yet on F1 status, therefore there's no CPT. So um, you're sort of like in limbo and therefore not work authorized. At this point, what would be the fastest way for him to restore his work authorization? Well, find another H1B employer would probably would probably be the best way um, to take harder and then also uh, try to see if you qualify for O1 extraordinary work visa. Not a lot of people do, but get evaluated. Maybe you do. And uh, if you have like published papers, if you had, uh, you know, um, did something original in your line of work, if you have won awards, if you have media coverage, if you have held important positions in associations, if you have, you know, just overall important person, if you get paid a lot, definitely, you know, um, fill out an O1 questionnaire. I can send that to you. It's a pretty long questionnaire. And once you feel, fill it out, you, you could probably tell if you qualify for this. O1 work visa has no quota and you can work for some kind of agency as well. So I have a lot of friends that are doing O1s and it's a very interesting type of work visa and it has no duration. You can, it, it'll last as long as dual intent, um, no duration and no petition. And other and other stuff is like if you're if you're a Canadian citizen, think about TN. If you are uh, Australian citizen, think about E three. If you're from Singapore or Chile, think about H one B one, which is you know um, doesn't have a lottery. So you know there are other options. Just changing to F one is not the best option. I get asked that a lot. Like I am on H one B and I want to immediately jump to F one. Um, that is usually difficult un unless you qualify for automatic validation and um, without knowing whether your I-94 mm -hmm. is expired or not because it's withdrawn by the previous employer, it's difficult to know if the border would even would, would be able to take you, you know, as a candidate for automatic revalidation. Okay, so that's case number one. It ta it's largely about H-1Bs being laid off, one of the options. Case number number two, case study number two, Kumar. Kumar's STEM OPT ended, uh, ends on June 1st, 2020. His employer registered him in the H-1B lottery, but his status shows submitted uh, on, as of April 26, 2020. So as of today, it still just says submitted. Uh, Kumar's F-1 visa and his passport is already expired at this point. Number one, is day one CPT still a good option? If yes, when should Kumar enroll in day one CPT school? So um, I get this is a very popular question. Day one CPT is always a good option right now because first of all, Kumar is on F1. So he's going from one F1 to the next F1. So there's no application needed. There's no change of status. There's no extension even required. You just have the new school, the day one CPT school, contact the old school, and then they work out a CBIS release and transfer to a new school. And then you will be able to set up CPT and then be able to work. Now, that usually would still take like two weeks or three weeks. So definitely you don't want to wait till the last minute if your employer does not, if Kumar's employer does not allow um, any kind of gap in the work, uh, in employment, then you might want to start early. For example, his um, STEM OPT ends in, on June 1st. So without going into the grace period, you should have the CPT already set up before that, maybe like a month ago, just in case. Um, so day one CPT is still a good option and he should enroll in day one CPT at least a month before you know his STEM OBT ends so that it gives him a little bit more time to set up and make sure he gets settled in, find the right school, you know, talk to the school, pay the fees and everything. So number two, what are the consequences of using day one CPT? Now, if you use day one CPT, uh, and the clue is here, Kumar was on STEM OPT and it ends in June. So we assume that he already did more than 12 months of OPT. And he's gonna go to a day one CPT school for another master degree program. So that's the same degree level. So when you have those two things, done 12 months of OPT, use CPT for more than one year on the same degree level, it will be difficult 
to change status to H-1B from within the United States down the road. It will not affect consular processing. It will not affect green card application. It will not affect stamping. I know that everybody's like, why won't? Because everybody thinks that if you go for H-1B stamping and you don't get it very quickly, or if you get denied, it's because you use day one CPT. That is not true because the consulate only really looks at the visa application and the petition and your CPT has nothing to do with that. So, I mean, consulate officers will can ask questions about CPT, but they're not going to say, hey, your H-1B is denied because CPT. <laughs> no, you could never find any reasoning that says that. So how do you respond to consulate officers question about CPT? Just tell the truth. I love this program. This program is going to help me with my career in the future. It provides very important, valuable learning experiences that I would otherwise not be able to get. Therefore, I decided to take on that program and maybe, you know, uh, after my STEM OVD is over and so that I can get a degree, a double degree, and at the same time, be able to gain valuable work experience. When you say that, obviously, you gotta look them in the eye and be like, that's I'm, what I'm saying is true. And in order to do that, you need to prepare yourself like a script almost and say it so much that it comes from your heart. You don't want to go in blind and like when they ask you a question about CPT and be like, oh, uh, CPT, you know, uh, yeah, it just, you know, uh, the work was fine. You know, I, I was doing work like uh, it doesn't answer the question why you wanted to do CPT, because what the consular officer may usually is curious about is why. Why do you why do you get a double degree? Well, because I can, because I'm smart. I am going to I'm going to have two master's degrees. Well, you're not going to say that, but I'm going to be like, you know, having a double degree is really it gives me the advantage, you know, in this day and age, because my first master was about information technology. My second master is about data analytics. And these two combined together can be super powerful in finding a job, getting a really high pay and diversify, you know, the type of projects that I can be on. I mean, all of these are true, but you have to prepare yourself to say that, you know, when you're uh, at the H-1B visa interview. And when they hear that, they go, oh, OK, that's why you use that. That's why you go into the one CPD school. Their assumption, of course, they, they will think that you use day one CPD just to continue working. But there's nothing wrong with continue working if the work is authorized. And when you do day one CPT, it's a legal program and you're, day, you're work authorized. So stop looking guilty and saying stuff like, oh, I, you know, I, I just thought I would continue my work authorization. No, you want to pinpoint to things that how the program helps you, you know, in the future, especially if you have two different degrees. I mean, it would be strange if you do two of the same degrees. I don't think people do that. So figure out how the degrees work together to your advantage for your career in the future. I mean, I'm sure it all makes sense. And, you know, the consular officer will want to hear that. So that's just my little sort of egress. I digress to talk about that. So, um, does not the consequences of using day one CPT. The only consequences as of today is, again, if you already used 12 months of OPT for the same degree level, if you go through 12 months of CPT, you should expect an RFE for your change of status down the road to H1B. So Kumar, if, he, if Kumar did six, uh, 12 months of OPT, and later on, he got selected in the lottery. He wants to change status to H-1B from within the United States, not consular processing. Then he would be able, he would run into an issue and he'll have to respond to an RFE. And this is where people freak out again. Oh my God, RFE. Oh my God, how can I avoid that? Oh my God. No. If you, res if you ignore that RFE and it gets denied, then the, the H-1B change of status application automatically turns into a consular processing. You just don't get the status, but you still get to take that approval notice, go and get your H-1B visa, get it stamped, and come back. And just because your change of status was denied, 
has nothing to do with the con whether the consulate gives you an H-1B visa or not. It's not even in their consideration. Just because they asked you about CPT, just because they asked you about status when you're back in the United States, they, it doesn't mean that they're denying your H-1B visa because of that. They might just be curious. They want to see how you interview. They want to see if you're telling the truth. Because a lot of petitions, H-1B petitions, are fraud. So they want to see that you know what you're talking about and that you've done everything right. So they can ask questions. You just have to have answers for them. And how do you have answers for them? Prepare in advance. You know, all, this, all the possible questions that they can ask. Figure out a way to answer with competence and with sincerity, you know, that's very important. So, um, oh, we're talking about the consequences of using day one CBT. So in that situation, if you get, he's, he's expecting an RFE for the change of status, then I would say, well, why don't you just file as consular processing? Like we talked about you know, in, pre in case study number one, choosing consular processing in this situation actually would be better. Right? Because in case number one, we said don't choose consular processing because you don't want to leave. But in this situation, down the road, and hopefully coronavirus wouldn't be as serious and countries are reopened and consulates are open, then just file your H1B as consular process, stay on day one CPT, and just wait for that to be approved. And once it is, then you take it and go and get visa stamped and come back. And then you will never get an RFE from USCIS. Although that's not true. I have seen consular processing petitions get an RFE for maintenance of status from USCIS. That's completely bogus. You just write them a letter and say, you're wrong. <laughs> this RFE is completely improper because we're not even asking for a status change. So why are you requesting evidence of maintenance of status? <laughs> it's just, I've seen that. I don't know why. It's just... I think people are just poorly trained or something. I have no idea. Some people, I'm sure they're, all the H-1B officers are brilliant. But there's bound to be that one bad apple that is kind of like, oh my God, I'm so tired today. Hit the wrong button and send out an RFE about maintenance of status when the petition is clearly consular processing. So, and another consequences that may happen, and I say may because, you know, it's like predicting the future, is that if the school gets shut down, then everybody in the school goes down with it, you know. So give me an example, like Farmington, well, that's a fake school, but like there are schools that offer um, these type of executive programs that get shut down because they don't keep the records well, they lose accreditations and whatnot, they become unable to issue I-20s. So if that happens, then you might face another issue of losing your status and there might be unlawful presence issues. So definitely choose the right school. How do you choose the right school? I don't know, because you know I'm not really investigating all the schools that offer day one CPT. I don't know how good they are, but I've dealt with su su substantial number of people from like Campbellsville, from Harrisburg, from Cumberland. I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, their system is set up so great. Like they're not super helpful, but I, don't think that they're at risk of being shut down, but it doesn't mean that I endorse any of those schools. Because what these schools do, and this is another advantage of using day one CPT, is that they condense, these schools, they condense their courses into like once or twice a semester, and all you have to do is go there for like a whole weekend. Um, and for the rest of the time you can work. That means you have a lot of mobility. You get to stay in the state you want to be in and just travel to the school uh, when there are classes. So that's very flexible. I mean, if you if you don't do day one CPT school and you can enroll, let's say if you enroll in like Harvard or whatever business school, you're gonna have to go to school every day to maintain your F1 status. But these executive programs are much more flexible when it comes to having to be physically present at school. But also do be careful. USCI has asked for maintenance of status uh, situation um, evidence about you traveling to school. So when you go to school, make sure you spend, like use your credit card, buy lunch, buy dinner, you know, buy your hotel room, buy your flight, so that you have a record that you actually went to school because USCIS could be asking for that. I've seen several RFEs where, you know, uh, USCIS goes back and asks for evidence that while you were doing the day one CBT schools, you did actually physically present. You were 
physically present, sorry, you were physically present at the courses because they're so short. Um, they're so far in between. So they wonder, like, if you just skipped it, like, how would they know? So make sure you have evidence, which is like hotel receipts, airline tickets, um, or at the very least, you know, credit card spendings over there. That way, it will physically place you there. I mean, it doesn't because you, someone can swipe your credit card. Yes, of course. But, you know, immigration law, the legal standard is by preponderance of the evidence. That means more likely than not that this is true, it will go your way. Okay, it doesn't require beyond all reasonable doubt. So if you have enough evidence, then it should get approved. Um, so keep your keep your records well. Okay, so that's very important when you do the NCPT. I know we were talking about consequences of doing their day one CBT, but now all of a sudden we're talking about like how to protect yourself in day one CBT. So all these, all these topics kind of just like you know expand on its own. Um, where were we? Um, can his COS application be approved even though? Can you start working day one CBT? What would be? Oh, I'm already at case study number two. Oh my God, I was looking at case study number one. Um, Oh, okay, number two, what are the consequences? Number three, does it matter if Kumar uses part-time day one CPT or full-time day one CPT? For the consequences, it doesn't matter because even if it's a part-time day one CPT, if you use it for more than 12 months, you still trigger the same rule of having done 12 months of OPT and then 12 months of CPT. So that will cause, a quite, uh, will cause an issue with a change of status. So... Um, does it matter if Kumar use part time? Part time really reduce the the only reason you want to go part time is if you haven't used OPT and you plan on using OPT down the road. For example, like you, this is your first master. You get in and you want to do a summer internship, uh, and then it turns into like a full time internship for a long time, but you don't want to do full time because all the time that you do full time CPT will be reduced from the time that you have OPT down the road. So that applies to a yet a different group of people altogether. So um, if you have done one master and you're doing the second master, then the change of status issue will attach. But if this is your first master, then the part-time, full-time CPT will be relevant because you do think about using OPT down the road and you want to have the full 12 months OPT and using full-time CPT will reduce that that um, time. So uh, number five, uh, wait, number four. If Kumar wants to avoid day one CPT, is there any other way to extend his EAD if he returns to school to take on another master's degree program? Day one, C so not doing day one CPT, extending his EAD. So if you don't do day one CPT, how do you extend your EAD? At this time, you know, when I see that question, I'm like, wow, that's a tough one. But right now you can get economic hardship EADs because of COVID-19. So if you bring up option, if you if your ed education is sponsored by someone else, like back home, you can always say because of the virus, now the, you know, uh, income has dropped dramatically and or there is a disaster or there are issues with my sponsor back home give me an EAD so that I can work during this time to be able to continue school and USCIS will give you will give you an EAD for that and usually it's generally approved within like 90 days so that's economic hardship EAD um, it is not the most ideal but it is an EAD that they do give so if you want to avoid day one CBT you can think about economic hardship EAD but there's processing time, you need to build the evidence, and it only applies to a small group of people. So I would ask Kumar if his education is sponsored by someone else back home and whether the uh, virus outbreak has affected uh, uh, his sponsor's ability to pay for his program. And if he does, then maybe, you know, uh, e economic hardship. But these economic hardship BADs are temporary. So they usually shouldn't last like more than a year. So. It's a stopgap measure. Um, I mean, he he still needs to uh, have his eyes set on next year's H one B, uh, you know, lottery or get a cap exempt 
uh, employer so that he can move away from this day one CPT situation. So day one CPT is really just a stop uh, stopgap measure for you to be able to uh, get on to the next status and have enough time to make the move. Uh, next question. Uh, would Kamar need to depart the U.S. and get another F-1 visa in order to join Day 1 CBT program? No, he doesn't because he's already on F-1 and he all he has to do is transfer his status to the new school and we talked about that and we're saying that again. So that, that's an advantage, especially at this day and age when traveling is very cumbersome, like it's, a, it's risky to travel. Um, so that would be... Again, just want to remind everyone, we'll be taking questions at the end, and I will go through all the questions, so you can put questions down, but I'm just not going to answer them right now. Uh, we're almost done. Um, uh, not, no, we're not almost done. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Kumar would like to stay in the U.S. until the end of the fiscal year in case his H-1B is selected. And I kind of sort of when I think I fell asleep after that, so it, it didn't continue. So what can he do? Well, he can do a change of status, you know, uh, before June 1st, before his demo WT ends, and just wait it out to see if he gets selected in the lottery. He can do day one CPT, and if he goes to day one CPT and he's selected in the lottery, he can still file, you know, uh, his H-1B. It doesn't eliminate that, uh, that um, option. That's another thing. Some people believe that if he goes to day one CPT school, somehow the H-1B, uh, if he's selected an H-1B like after that, then it won't be valid anymore. I don't know where they get that from. Uh, it's not true either. So, uh, let's see. So, in order to stay in the U.S. to until the end of the fiscal year to uh, to see if it's H-1B selected, I would say file a change of status uh, or, do, uh, or do a day one CPT transfer. Uh, and you can also, like, you know, we mentioned before, do like an O-1 assessment to see if O-1 is a good fit. Um, and there are other types of work visas that it's, you know, I'm just going to kind of like throw it out there. But, you know, um, there is something called B-1 in lieu of H-1B. If your employer has a foreign presence, like U.S. employer that you're working for, they have a company in Canada or in India, you can be hired by that company and apply for an B-1 in lieu of H-1B and come work here for six months up to a year. Um, it H-1B requirements all attach, but it's a B-1. It doesn't require a petition. You go directly and apply that at the consulate. So if your employer has a counterpart abroad and they can hire you and send you here, you have to be paid there. Like they have to do the salary and all that there. You are just a transferee to work here in the United States. So you'll be doing the same work, but your salary will have to come from the foreign worker or the foreign uh, uh, office. That is B one in lieu of H one B. This is a very, this is a very unique um, work visa that not a lot of people know of. Uh, you can also try H three trainee visa, but you know your employer would have to develop a training program for you. Most employers don't want to do that, so that's not really a good option. You can also look into like J one. You know J one can place you sometimes with certain employers, but you have to talk to the J one sponsors. Uh, we, I, we don't do a lot of J ones, but J one is possible and it's very expensive because the um, sponsoring organizations charge a lot of money to place you. So J one is another possibility. Okay, now case and study. Wait, um, there's something here. It says Kumar received good news from his employer that his H1B selected. However, he's concerned that the H1B petition. Hmm. I kind of stop right there. Anyway, <laughs> let's not go there. So let's go to case study number three. Sandeep has been working on H1B for six years. His current H1B is going to max out on June 20, 2020. His employer has gone through the perm process, um, filed less than 365 to go, days ago, and uh, filed his I-140 with USCIS since January 2020. So I-140 is pending, and uh, and this fact is, is important because you, you can extend your H-1B beyond the six-year max if you have an approved I-140, or if your perm has been processed, has been in process for 365 days. Um, so he's employer filed his I-140 in January. Premium processing is unavailable until June 29, 2020. Don't quote me on that, that's what USDI said, but we don't even know if it, it will come back on uh, June 29th. I'm just saying maybe, uh, but probably. I would, I would imagine, yeah. He would like to stay in the US and continue working for his employer. 
Number one, if he files a COS to B2 and while waiting for the COS application, his I-140 is approved, can he remain in the United States by extending his H-1B status? I recently learned that that's, that's possible. I always thought that the H-1, the I-140 has to be approved before the H-1B max out, but no. Um, well, this is based on the research that I did with my paralegal, and hopefully it's it's correct. I'm pretty sure. So, like, let's say he applies for change of status. He can't work in the meantime, of course. Um, I mean, he can. There's a 245K, but shh, nobody tell you. So anyway, so he he can't. He doesn't work for that period of time, uh, and then four months into the B2 change of status application. Remember the change of status application is going to take six, seven, or eight months to get approved. Remember we talked about that in prior case studies? So he waits and waits and waits. Four months later, his H1B, I mean, his uh, I-140 is approved because premium processing comes back or it just approved naturally. Then he's eligible to extend his status. Now he has been in the US on B2. So if that application gets approved, he can then file it to H1B back again with a change of status. So the B2 again becomes that bridge application to bridge him from the loss of H1B to the next H1B. And the key moment where that happens is that the I-140 is approved, either through premium processing or through regular processing. So the question, uh, can he remain in the United States by extending his H1B status? Yes, if. USCIS approves that B1 change of status, B2 change of status, and then approves the H1B extension based on AC21. Now, if USCIS, what if people are going to ask, well, what if USCIS denies the B2 change of status? Well, then the application will, the extension will not be approved because the status didn't bridge, the bridge, the bridge collapsed. Then this new petition will be approved with I-797B, and we talked about this, because there's no status, it won't have a new I-94, you get an approval notice, I-797B, take that approval notice, go outside the country, come back in. And so there are two possibilities. You have an F1, you have an H-1B visa in your passport, or you don't have an H-1B visa in your passport. If you already have an H-1B visa in your passport, it's not expired, just go to the border and come right back in. If you don't have an H-1B visa in your passport, you're gonna go and get an H-1B visa and then come back in to activate that petition um, for Sandeep. So uh, that's the answer to that one. If he departs from the United States, can his employer extend his H-1B validity after I-140 approval while he's not physically in the United States? I also get this a lot. People think that they can't do this while they're outside the United States. No, it's actually safer if you're outside the United States. So, because you don't have to worry about the B2 application not being approved, right? Because you're not filing a B2 application. You're just outside. You don't need anything. So you leave and uh, Sandeep leaves. And sorry, is that his name? Yeah, Sandeep. Sandeep leaves and four months later, five months later, uh, having worked remotely for their, his employer, you know, abroad, um, you can do that, but not for long because employers don't, it's hard to pay someone when you're not here. There are tax issues. But let's say he works remotely and the employer keeps the I-140 going and the I-140 becomes approved, like say in October, then he just files, you know, his employer would just file another H-1B petition for him without requesting extension. What would the employer ask for? Consulate processing because he's not here. So he's gonna process from a consulate. So the employer files an H-1B consulate processing petition for him Premium processing is back then, October, has to be back. Then the, you know, gets approved very quickly. Then Sandeep will then take that approval notice, either enter the United States with his existing H-1B visa and his passport, or go and get an H-1B visa from the U.S. consulate if his H-1B visa is already expired. It sounds like it's going to be expired because, you know, he's been here for six years. So he probably had an H-1B visa stamped at some point, and it's like more than five years ago. So probably expired. So then you'll probably have to go to the consulate, get another H-1B visa, and then come back in here. Now, people are going to say, well, is that risky? Well, I, whenever I hear that question, I don't know how to answer because you have to identify the risks for me to be able to say if it's risky. Uh, if you just blankly say, hey, is it risky? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about because, I mean, if it's risky, then we wouldn't be suggesting you to do this. And this is pretty much the only way. So, um, 
yeah, so avoid, is this risky without identifying the risks? Anyway, uh, so that's just my little complaint. Um, let's see, if the PAC stays outside the United States and another employer wants to file for H-1B after his I-140 is approved, would that be possible? Yes. So I-140 after it's approved, even if that employer withdraws it, based on the 2017 memo, you can still have well, yeah, it has to be approved after it's withdrawn, not before. We have to be clear on that. So after it's approved and the employer says, I don't want to keep it going anymore, so they yank it, you know, they withdraw that. And can another employer still file for H-1B for this person, for DPAC, to come back? I think the answer is yes. Um, or I, I used to think that they have to have the new employee would have to start an I-140 process all over again, get the I-140 approved, then use that I-140 approval notice to get the H-1B extension beyond the six year. But no, I it's, right now the rule seems to be, or the policy seems to be that once the, H1, the I-140 is approved, it doesn't necessarily need to be revived first for the employee to qualify for another H-1B uh, max, you know, like max out H-1B after six year. So that's... Very interesting, uh, because those are kind of new, like they're from 2017, and um, I mean, I think people have put them to the test, but uh, it's not so popular, you know, it's not so um, commonplace, you know, as a situation. So, okay. So that's all the materials for today, but let's go through some of the questions. Okay. I have them all saved up here. Okay, let's, let's uh, first answer questions from... Mr. Kachia, I am on 60 day grace period, planning to file COS from H1B to, B to F2. If my COS is under process and I find another employer, can I start working on receiving H1B transfer receipt or have to wait till it's approved? Let me point to, to case study number one. Question number, the one about joining upon receipt, number four. Okay, so your employer can, you can join your employer if the H-1B is filed as an extension, not consular processing, okay? Now, uh, you are still in grace period, so there's no problem if you file within grace period. But if you go outside the grace period, then what happens? Then you can request an extension, but it might not be approved because you are outside the grace period. So, but what you can still file an extension and you can still join the employer, but when USCIS denies the extension portion and give you an I-797B approval notice, you have to stop working at that moment and go and come back in to activate that petition because work authorization would end at that moment. So that's the important thing to know. Um, so to answer your question, can I start working on receiving H-1B transfer receipt? Yes, if it's uh, filed as an extension, and uh, just to know, if it if the extension part gets denied, you have to stop working and immediately re-enter the U.S. to activate that petition. Okay, next question uh, from Ankit Patel. I am on F1, and my spouse is U.S. citizen. I got I-765 and I-131 I3, I3, I3 approved. Can I drop my study? Will it affect my I-45 process? No, it will not affect your I four eighty five process if you drop out of if you drop out from your F one program. Your your I four eighty five can still be approved, but I should say that it will not be denied because you dropped out of the program. However, if things happen and your I four eighty five cannot continue anymore, for example, God forbid, um, you get a divorce, then you will not have another status to fall back on. Once your wife withdraws the I-130, you are completely out of status. That moment, there's no grace period. So would it be smart to keep your school going so that you give yourself at least a backup option in case something happens? I would say as an attorney, I am a pessimist. I need to plan for the worst. So if you're asking me, is a good idea to drop out of your F1 to wait for the I-485? I would always say no, but it's your decision, obviously, because it's not gonna cause the I-485 to, to be denied. 
not because you know you dropped out of study because your I-485 is not based on that at all. Uh, and you already maintain status all the way until you file the I-485, and that's what that counts. So after filing, you know, you don't technically have to maintain, you know, the same uh, non-immigrant status. Good question. Um, let's see. Hi, Jack. This is Rajabinesh. Um, perm approved. I-140 filed on April 23rd. Max out an I-94 expiry in June 12, 2020. Sounds like case. Sounds like a Sandeep situation, doesn't it? Okay. Um, after I leave the country, will my I-140 still be processed? Yes. If your employer continues to process the I-140, it will be processed. As long as they don't withdraw. USCI doesn't know you've departed. They don't care. They are only looking at the I-140 for ability to pay, whether the perm was done right, and whether you have the required experience for the position. So, uh, so I can come back USA after I'm 40 followed by h one extension approval. Yes, you're. This is this is exact, almost exactly like Sandeep situation. Will this be impacted based on the EO? Oh, oh, do we want to go into the EO right now? Let's go into the EO right now. Okay, so right now the EO only blocks immigrant. Well, first of all, two things: outside the U.S. and getting an immigrant visa. So as of now, this question, the answer to that question is no. It will not be affected by the EO because you are getting an H-1B visa, which is a non-immigrant visa. You're not an immigrant, therefore the EO doesn't apply to you. But the EO is bound to be reassessed in 30 days. So we don't know at this point what the EO is going to say 30, 30 days down the road. But by the way, Trump self-destructs you know, in his little coronavirus briefings. I don't think that he's going to have the time to, I don't know, really think about this EO. The thing about the EO is that when he first tweeted, he said, stop immigration. Everyone was just like, oh my God, what is he going to do? And then he eked out this little EO that says, oh, only, you know, immigrant visa people are going to be affected. And oh, if you already have an immigrant visa, you're fine. And I was just like, okay, so that, I mean, I have a lot of clients that only applies to maybe one client. So it's like a very small group of people that are affected by this. And, you know, like I said in my other video, the consulates might be closed for the next 60 days. So why does it matter that, I mean, no one's getting an immigrant visa in the next 60 days anyway. So it's like this EO is a complete waste of time. Like, I think he just tweeted because Kim Jong-un was dying and he's like, I'm not going to let this guy take my airtime. I'm going to say something really shocking. So stop. I'm going to stop immigration. And then everybody was like, oh my god, oh my god. And everybody started looking at him, you know, like, oh my, all eyes on Trump. And then his, his aides were like, oh fuck, what are we going to do? Like, what, what stop immigration? Like, what are we talking about? And then they all got together and say, well, the best way to deal with this, talk, this little tweet is to create the smallest people covered, a, a number of people covered by the EO so that nobody really complains because no one's really covered. And if no one's really covered, then no one really cares, right? Just whatever he says, whatever he does. Uh, and it helps with his base voters because his base voters are going to think that somehow he managed to stop immigration at some point because it says, you know, you can't get an immigrant visa. It sounds serious, but it really isn't because given the situation and how many people this actually affects, it's a very small number. Anyway, that's too long of a digress. Let's move on. Um, next question. How will be the new H-1B visa approval rate this year, it will, it will any impact on approval? I think that this year, the H-1B approval rate is going to be much higher because the federal courts came down with three cases telling USCIS that the way they've been looking at the H-1B based on degree requirement and the OOH, Occupational Outlook Handbook, and also deference to previous approvals were all wrong. So the federal court ba basically like my paralegal said, spanked USCIS and said, in the last five years, you guys have fucked up. And these are not the way you're supposed to look at H-1Bs. The H-1B is supposed to be more streamlined. If the OOH says that this position, mostly or commonly, even 80% requires a college degree, 
then you need to move on to see if the person qualifies the position and not say, oh, well, it doesn't always require, you know, a degree. So it's not a specialty occupation. And you can't say like, oh, the degree is too general, like business administration. We don't know what it really says. We don't know what it really needs. No, like the federal court says, no, no, no. This is not the way to look at H-1B. Because five years ago, H-1B was easy. And I wasn't charging a lot of money for H-1B because they were pretty streamlined. Like, you know, if you, you can tell from like five feet away whether that case is going to get approved by the degree and the position. You just look at the OH and boom, what voila, you, not a lot of analysis. But nowadays, you have to look at the degree requirements and what the position requires and then like fly on the wage level and then you have to talk about the job description and like really nitpick on the job description and make sure that, you know, they, they're not, they're like, complex enough involving a lot of analysis you know exercise of professional judgment that's just bullshit that's not what h1b was like five years ago so i think that the approval rate was much higher because the federal court has already came down with decisions saying that uscis way of looking at the h1b reviewing the h1b is wrong so let's move on <clears throat> okay uh what are the chances wait a minute oh yeah he hasn't asked a question. Has he? No. Okay. What are the chances of approval for change of status from a pending B2 back to H1B? Also, can we work on receipt if the employer initiates your transfer? This is a good question. And this is also case study number one. So it's back to DPAC situation. So um, we talked about uh, filing a, B2, a change of status to B2 to buy you more time. Uh, and is it easy to change it back to H-1B? Yes, if you have an employer and you're willing to wait the time. Remember, when you file for B-2, it takes like five or six or seven months to get approved. And then, so it depends on when you find a new employer to file that change back to H-1B. For example, if you lost your job today, you file a change of status to B-2, and two weeks later, you... Well, let's say two weeks is too easy. Let's say 65 days later, outside the grace period, you find an employer and then you file a change of, you, you would file, at that point, I would say, don't file a change of status. You file an extension citing COVID, you know, citing COVID virus and a late filing. So forget about that B2, you just withdraw it as if it never happened because you want an extension and you're still close enough in time. Now, let's assume another scenario. You lost your job today, and five months later, you find another employer, and your B-2 change of status is still pending. At that point, you probably would have to file a change of status from B-2 and use B-2 as a bridge connection, because if you file a late filing for five months, I don't know if that's going to get approved. The time period simply is too long. So I guess the answer to this question is, when is this change of status going to happen? The sooner it happens, the higher the likelihood of approval. But I wouldn't say it's because you're changing status from B2 to H1B. You, If you file another H1B close enough in time, you're trying to do a late filing extension based on COVID-19, not because you're changing status from B2. Because if you make that decision, you file an application, you say, I'm changing status from B2. You've got to wait for that bridge to be built first. So that bridge has to be approved in order for that to work. So if you find yourself five or six months later in the future, and you have to file another H1B, and your B2 is already approved, by all means, it will be very simple because your B2 is already approved. So you don't have to worry about it. You're already in status and when you're in status, you can file for another change of status. You're going to wait it out, though. Once you're waiting for that B2 change back to H1B, you cannot work because you're not auth work authorized on B2 and you cannot join them on receipt, which answers your uh, George's next, Sean George's next question. Can you work for that employer? Now, see, you, there are two major differences. The first scenario, you can work on receipt for the employer because you're connecting the uh, transfer petition to the to the H-1B. So you file an extension. And remember we talked about extensions allowing you to join on receipt. That's question number four uh, of uh, DPAC situation case study number one. Uh, if you file from a B-2 change of status back to H-1, you cannot work 
and that change of status will take a long time. At that point, you might as well cancel the process or re-enter if you have an H-1B visa that's not expired instead of filing a change of status from B-2 because that's just going to drag it out for so long. So good question because that question touches upon and flushes out a lot of issues. Now, um, let's see. Uh, what if we enroll in PDH day one? PhD, I think that's what it is. Day one CPD program instead of same level. Would we be able to apply for COS to get it? Oh, oh my God. X shot. I love you. I love that question because I forgot to talk about that in my case study. Well, so one way to avoid, remember the, the rule that it triggers the change of state of application is that if you use 12 months of OBT and then you use 12 months of CBT on the same degree level, PhD is not the same degree level. So you get to uh, avoid that issue. Another way to avoid issues is if you don't do uh, day one CPD for more than one year and just cut it off like on 11 months, then you'll be less likely to get an RFE. So, but having said that, I still see RFEs, but you just tell them, hey, the rule is not triggered. So you're wrong because USCIS, sometimes they don't even think about these things. You just send out an RFE because they're so busy. Um, so it's not like completely impossible to get an RFE, but doing day one CPT on a PhD level will more likely avoid triggering that uh, cha change of status RFE rule. Uh, and there are a lot of programs now, a lot of schools are catching on this and they're like, okay, let's design a PhD program and, um, you know, like f satisfy the requirements and then offer day one CPT. So look for programs like that, I guess, if you already have a master. And always when you go for stamping and you're in a PhD program, that sounds better than, you know, doing a second master. Just, I don't know, for optics, it just looks better, I guess. And a PhD is always so prestigious, right? So love that question. Thank you, Ashot. That was really great. Okay, now next question. With premium processing suspended, can one star work for a new employer on H1B transfer receipt while taking an unpaid leave of absence from previous employer? Yes, of course. Um, so that if the transfer experiences issues, one can switch back to employer A. Yes, because your work authorized for employer A, because you have an approved petition on I-94, and you are work authorized for employer B, because you filed a transfer petition with extension requests, and that allows you to work, and that's AC-21, that's the law. So since you are work authorized for both employers, then you can get paid by them both. So that's not a problem. And this is actually a really good um, strategy to for H-1B um, transfer, if you have a really good relationship with your employer, then you can tell them, hey, look, you know, I have this other thing. And if you, you know, if it doesn't work out, I would always love to come back. I don't know how that works because, you know, if my assistant tells me that, I'll be like, get out of here. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, but it's definitely a strategy to keep in the back of your head, especially when you know, your employer is amenable to this kind of arrangement. Okay, so, um, uh, where were we? Oh, Ashish uh, Kapali. Hi, Jack. I'm on my STEM OBT, which ends on July 1st. My green card is on process. I might get GCEAD anytime soon. My H1B got selected too this year. Wow, great. If my EAD got extended, until September 31st due to cap gap. If somehow my HIV gets denied, do I have grace period to join another college? Yes, you do. So STEM will be ends in July. Uh, green card is on process. I don't know what that really means because if you already filed the I-485, then it's a different analysis. But if you only file the I-140, then that's a different analysis. But judging by the name, I would guess that only the I-140 is filed, or I don't know what in process means. So um, we might have to sort of analyze different scenarios here. But when you tr transfer your CBUS from the STEM OBT school to the new school, day one to your day one CPT school, um, join another college. So it's not day one CPT, just another program. You just transfer your CBUS over. And this transfer doesn't concern itself 
with whether you have a pending green card application. This is what I hear about people too, like, oh, F1s cannot have immigrant intent. Uh, so anything I do with a green card while on F1 is highly problematic, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not true. So I would say um, the green card being in process doesn't affect your ability to transfer your CVS and enroll in another school. So um, do I have a grace period to join another college when it's denied? No. Um, you, if you want to transfer to the school, you got to do it within 60 days after July 1st um, or soon because the question here is, when will the CBIS be denied or uh, terminated? Because when you're on cap gap until September, if your HMB gets denied, what I've seen is that there are CBIS that gets terminated right after that. Like it, the the top cap, the cap cap just ends on that day. I've also seen CBIS go all the way until September, the end of September, even though H one B petition was denied. So. Um, if you want to transfer your CBIS, you need to have uh, the CBIS not terminated. So if you wait until the H1B is denied, and then you go to your DSL and you go, oh, it's time to transfer, and they go into the system and it's already terminated, then you have to re-enter the United States in order to activate. And that's the automatic revalidation that we're talking about. You have an F1 uh, I-94 that is unexpired because it's D slash S, and you have a new I-20, and you are an essential traveler because you're coming back to uh, go to school, then at that point, you would have to re-enter the United States if uh, your CBIS is already terminated. So would you get grace period? I would say no. It's a very fuzzy thing. Uh, if, you wait till the la if you wait till the last minute, it's more likely that you won't be able to transfer. You would have to re-enter the United States. So that's what I would say about that. Um, okay. Uh, swap on. How hard is it to get H1B approval for day one CPT? How hard is it to get H1B approval? I do not understand that question, so I'm going to have to skip it. Um, which, is, which one is advisable for day one CPT holder picked up day one H1B COS or consular processing? We already talked about that. It's in the notes. So consular processing. Uh, next question. Satish, is there any issue in traveling internationally while being on day one CPT and after F1 visa expires? Okay, if we travel after this period, then we have to go for F1 visa stamping again. Yes, as it's expired. I heard that people face denial doing F1 uh, visa stamping again for day one CPT college, or even if F1 stamped, then face entry denied doing immigration at port of entry. So is it advisable to travel internationally while on day one CPT status? Is that correct? Unfortunately, I have to say there's some truth in that. We were talking about H1B not being denied we're using day one CPT, okay? Now we're talking about F1 having a higher likelihood of being denied because you're on day one CPT. Now, that is true because H F H1B is based on an approved petition. So there's more equity involved. You can't just arbitrarily deny H1B. But a day one, an F1 visa is completely discretionary. What that means is if I'm a visa officer and I don't like the way you dress, I'm going to just say no. I don't have to explain myself. I can just walk away. And then you won't really have a chance to defend why you don't look like, you know, you intend to study in the United States or you, like you're not really doing what you said you're going to be doing. So the risk is higher. So if you don't want to take that risk, then don't travel. But if you don't mind the risk because you're well prepared for that visa interview, you have already something written clear and concise about the situation. Because when you walk up to them, they'll say, well, how can I help you? Then you'll say, I'm here to apply for an F1 visa because my visa has expired and I'm in uh, a master's degree or PhD degree uh, in this school and I need to go back to resume my school. And if they hear like, oh, Cumberland, then they will say, oh, you're on day one CBT. I'll be like, oh, the school offers CBT program and I am on CBT program because it gives me valuable work experience that will help me, you know, with my career in the future. I'm doing, I already did one master in this and I'm doing this other master and combined, they generate more opportunities in the future. That's why I decided to take on this program. Well, see, I'm not even prepared to say that. So I feel like when I looking, when I look at myself saying that, it could sound a little disingenuous or whatever, but 
if you practice, then you'll be more likely to be able to say it from your heart. Because, you know, I'm not doing the CBD, so I can't really say it from my heart. But anyway, so the, the answer, is that correct? Yes, it's correct that you are going to be less likely to get an F1 visa renewed compared to an H1B visa if you travel internationally and you are in a day one CBD school. Now, if you successfully get the visa, I have not really heard anyone being denied at the border for coming in. That um, I don't think is correct. So that's my answer to those two questions. Um, how hard is it to get the O1A? It's very hard. Uh, next question. Um, which, uh, oh, right here. If employer A has filed for transfer and in the meantime you find another employer B, can we ask employer A to withdraw the petition already filed? Yes, of course. Um, if petition to transfer to a employer A is denied and you get an RFE and there is pending transfer in process by another employer, will it, will it have an impact on that petition? No. I mean, it depends on when it was filed, I guess, because, it, like, you know, we talked about if you file it too far away from the extension, because what I'm hearing is like, okay, you had an H1B, you got laid off, and you file another extension. I mean, you file another, you file another employer, they file an extension. And while the extension is pending, you find another employer, and then they file another extension. But this extension is probably attached to that case, because, you know, it, this has not been approved, so you can't really attach it to this. So if this gets denied, then it depends on how far this gap is. And I mean, the petition can still be approved, but are you going to get a new I-94? I don't know because, you know, there's been a gap and there's no bridge, right? So we talked about the bridge petition. The bridge has collapsed. So, because it got denied. Um, that's what I would say about that one. Uh, let's see. Tito Mitra. Can Trump legally stop OA Trump B renewals or issues in the near future going by Section 6 of his latest EO? Yes, he can. But will he? No. Because the lobbyists are way too strong, even for Trump to face. There's Facebook, there's Google, there is Apple. They'll use a ton of H1Bs and consultancies, and they'll pay lots of money to lobbyists. And, you know, as, as rash as Trump, I mean, he still looks to money. And, I mean, he likes to piss off the IT people, but doing that is just way too dramatic, I think. It wouldn't really help with the economy. It would create more chaos. Right now, he has bigger fish to fry, I think. Um, so, no, I don't think. Uh, truthy, I am an inventor of a patent. Does that qualify me for the O1? Not by itself. I mean, the O1 has 10 criteria. You have to get three or four. Better to have four, but the minimum requirement is three. But if you have four and one of them doesn't really fit, then you can still have three. So uh, having patent alone generally doesn't in and of itself bring O1. Uh, you can see if the patent has won any awards or has any significant applications. Um, those are all evidence that you will develop with the O1 lawyer. Uh, they're supposed to talk to you about these kind of things so that they can maximize your um, ability to qualify for the O1. Uh, next question. Alaric Batra. Hey, Jack. Uh, while doing day one CBD, let's say H1B gets approved as consular processing, then while at consulate to get the stamp, how to answer if VO asked why did one not apply as COS? I've never had them ask this question because they don't really care. Uh, I would say it's outside of my control whether my employer files consular processing or change of status. I'm not part of that decision. So why you ask me? <laughs> I wouldn't say like why you ask me, but I'll be like, oh, that's not my decision. It's an employer's petition. Um, okay, so they don't really ask that because what's I don't know the answer because I don't know why my employer filed change of status or consular processing. <laughs> uh, their lawyer told them to. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. My contract with client employer ended last Friday, and if I take voluntary leaves for a month, uh, if I'm paid, when does 60-day grace period start? It starts on the last day that you got paid, um, even if it's voluntary leave. So that's the argument I would make. Uh, let's see. If one has used 12 months of OPT 
for their first master degree, can they get a CBT and LOBT extension for the same level of study? So OBT for the same level? No. Uh, CPT? Yes. But remember, it might trigger the change of status problem if used more than 12 months. And we talked about that in one of our case studies. Uh, next question. Is it okay if my passport gets expired while applying for I-140 and GC process? Yes. GC and I-140 don't care about passport. Only non-immigrant visa applications do. Um, my passport is expired in two months and no consulate is open to renew anytime soon. That's fine. It doesn't matter for GC. Uh, next question. If I-45 is pending, do we need to maintain status? No. But remember, if you voluntarily drop out of your current status while the I-485 is pending, if anything happens to the I-485 and it gets denied, you'll be immediately completely out of status and you won't have options to refile, you won't have options, you have to leave. So let's say if you're on F1 and you decide to, you decide to drop out and then the I-485 gets denied, then you cannot go back on F1 status from within the United States, you'll have to leave and come back in. But if you're still on F1, after the I-485 is denied, you automatically fall back to that F1 status, as if nothing's happened. So, would you want to keep your status? I guess it depends on the strength of the I-485, um, and if there's absolutely no reason why it should get denied, then perhaps you can, deny, uh, you can drop out of status, but you'll be losing a backup option. Okay, that looks like all the questions. Oh wait, there's another one. Uh, Zhiwei Yang, can I start the day one CPT when I am in the OBT grace period? Yes. During OBT grace period, your CBIS should still be active, allowing you to transfer to another university that offers day one CPT. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, the room ready. Any hope for people in submitted status this year's lottery? Yes. The lottery is still ongoing according to USCIS until the end of the fiscal year. And uh, every um, every fiscal year ends in September. Uh, well, October 1st. So, is there hope? Yes. Okay. So, I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you guys all for joining us on for such a long time on a Sunday. Um... Oh, we only run for like an hour and a half. Well, that's good. It felt like three mm -hmm. hours. Um, so, well, thank you and mm -hmm. good luck. I hope you all learned a lot from this. And as a goodbye, you know, notice, please. Oh, another question, Sruthi. Can H1B work on C2C basis? C2C client to client? What's C2C? Anyway, message me later because I need to do my, my ending. So the ending is that if you have friends who you think will benefit from this video, share it with them mm -hmm. and have them follow me and they can choose C first so that they don't ever miss another live session with me and have them join our wonderful help group, uh, U.S. Work Visa and Green Card and Citizenship Help. Again, that's U.S. Work Visa and Green Card and Citizenship Help. So, um, well, uh, I hope you guys still have time to enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.